Now, with views you can trust and opinions you cannot ignore, the State of the Nation, next on Ave Verna 24. The following program on Ave Verna 24 is classified MA. It is intended for adults and may be unsuitable for children under 17. It may contain crude and decent language, explicit sexual activity, graphic violence, or political ideology. Viewer discretion is strictly advised. State of the Nation is an opinion-based program. The thoughts and opinions shared within this program are not intended to offend or disregard anyone's perspectives or beliefs. We aim to foster open dialogue, encourage critical thinking, and explore thought-provoking subjects. Recognizing the importance of diversity and inclusion, this program welcomes all viewpoints and cherishes the right to express them freely. This program also contains the opinions of the participants and does not reflect the views and beliefs of the Veterana Media Network. The network believes in a safe space for all ideas to be expressed and on its duty to create such a platform for free speech. Viewer discretion is strictly advised. The vaccinated economy. Bloomberg says that Sri Lanka's rupee will crash again by the end of the year. Is it the beginning of that? However, our trusted central bank, which has meticulously adapted all commands by the IMF, says, do not worry, we are on track. We all know what implementing the IMF program will be like. And then there's the story of the vaccines. Were we prudent in getting a jab that was not tested accurately? For insights and analysis, tonight I will speak to the Secretary of Australians for Science and Freedom, Dr. Julie Sladden, Medical General Practitioner and Professor at the Australian University, Professor David Richards, Leader of the Pivithuru Hela Urumea, Parliamentarian Uduya Gambanpila, President's Council Mohan Virakon, Group Chairman of the Blue Ocean Group, Thumilan Sivaraja. Good evening, I'm Mahesh Joni and this is the State of the Nation. Hello everyone and welcome to the State of the Nation, the program that's here to challenge the status quo and keep you informed. A lot to talk to you about this evening, so let's get down to business. Last week, I had the pleasure of chatting with Professor Rohan Gunaratna, a world-renowned terrorism expert who recently released a book titled Sri Lanka's Easter Sunday Massacre, Lessons for the International Community. I also sat down with him for an episode of Get Real, which will air this Tuesday. Um, that is, you really have to watch that one because he says some really good points about our country and our security. Now, in this book, he detailed how the environment was masterfully calculated and more important, covertly altered by the very people who wanted Sri Lanka to be on the brink of discord and disruption. Mind you, it was 10 years down the line since we won the war. We had peace for 10 years. We were able to focus on other things like the economy, development, foreign policy and trade. And well, for the Colombo liberal idiot class, going after the Rajpaksas, feasting on their flesh, putting them in jail, brewing Rajpaksa tea so that they can feel their angry lives calmed. All that. But that peace was not right for the overlords of this nation. That peace was stepping on many people's toes. Sri Lanka was becoming more independent. Its people started thinking along the lines of being a Sri Lankan and not the way the West told us how to think. Now that needs to end immediately. Professor Rohan Gunaratna brilliantly displays that to create life-altering chaos, you must first dismantle the security space. And they did just that. In 2015, in the wake of the Yahapalne government, anything nationalistic or patriotic was considered absolutely bad. Security was put on the back burner, national interests were laughed at and scoffed upon. All foreign agendas that never would have seen the light of day came to light. And Sri Lanka was systematically being weakened from within, which led to such a calculated pre-planned atrocity like the Easter Sunday massacre which resulted in 275 innocent Sri Lankans paying the price. Who led the way back in 2015 to dismantle Sri Lanka? 
Well, it's the usual NGO brigade, the human rights jokers, and of course, the West slaving economic minds along with their unthink tanks. And the discord political parties who knew they would never garner power through a democratic manner. It took some time for the people to wake up. They woke up in 2019. Unfortunately, the horse we all bet on in 2019 was proven to be a dud. Nangi penala akkaduna scenario. Because we thought we were getting the lion spirited defense secretary as our president. But later we realized that instant we got a lion carcass for the president. The lion was dead long time. Just think for a moment, history is repeating. Everything that is happening right now in terms of our economy, politics and uh, social circles after the whole unrest of last year is dismantling the ideology of what it means to be a Sri Lankan and done once again systematically. Now with the unrest of last year, it's basically a repeat of 2015 regime change operation. This time they went back to the drawing board and meticulously planned again how to hammer those very same things they did hammer back in 2015. Nationalism, Sri Lankan ideology and more importantly Sri Lankan values along with our security. But this time they wanted it gone for good. Again the usual NGO brigade, the human rights jokers along with their fake journalists who are really discord activists, social media goons, those West slaving economic minds and their unthink tanks and of course those discord political parties once again took the forefront to create the chaos and pave the way for those disrupting agendas led by the overlords to once again set itself nice and cozy in this nation of ours. But who are these overlords Mahesh? Just look around, just look as to who our government is bowing down to on a daily basis. This time they managed to get the very people who stood against them back in 2009 and 2019. I honestly wonder how long it will take this time for the Sri Lankan people to wake up and realize that smell is in the coffee. It's the burnt aspirations of an independent Sri Lanka. We'll be right back. Welcome back everyone to the State of the Nation. In our lead story tonight, the complications are rising across the world about the mRNA vaccines which were administered as a solution for the COVID pandemic. Now what's the efficacy? Has it really, be, uh, really helped or caused more harm and created a new pool of patients with other sicknesses? Now, as you know, this is a tough pill to swallow because, for one, we are censored by all authorities for talking about this. And second, we are all victims. We trusted the people on the top, our government, our health officials and our health administrative individuals to ensure that they do their job to the fullest possible extent to safeguard our lives. Right now, with various reports popping up across the world, we cannot ignore the fact and we must talk about it despite the massive censorship on this subject. I'm guilty too. I also got it wrong in the initial part. If you look at uh, any of the shows I was doing uh, during the COVID time, every official who came on my show from the government to the private sector assured us that the vaccines develop in haste, but pretty safe and good for us. So believing them each and every night, I told you to take the vaccine. And that is something I shouldn't have done. Now let's try to under, understand uh, what we are learning from all over the world about COVID vaccine complications. Experts say some complications including strokes and clots are expected though extremely rare. Others say it is common and these vaccines must be suspended. Recently, MIT professor Ratsev Levy also took to Twitter to share the harm mRNA vaccines are causing in young people. The analysis of the EMS scores and diagnosis data 
from 2019 throughout the first half of 2021 revealed some very concerning signals. We detected an increase of 25% in the calls with cardiac arrest diagnosis among ages 16 to 39 in the first half of 2021, exactly when the vaccination campaign in Israel was launched. Many say the risk of a stroke is more from the infection and not from the vaccine. Multiple studies have shown that the chance of getting a stroke after a vaccine is no greater than not receiving a vaccine. That being said, COVID in itself is a risk factor for heart attacks and stroke. That's because it has an effect on the endothelial lining or the inner lining of our blood vessels. As far as Indian vaccines are concerned, yes, like with any other medical products, they do have complications that are extremely rare. Pretty concerning stuff, isn't it? Now, there is an increased number of experts that are questioning the necessity, efficacy and safety of the mRNA COVID-19 vaccines. A paper published late last year in Elsevier's Vaccine Journal by a team of scientists led by Dr. Joseph Freeman sought to examine serious adverse events reported in the clinical trials of the Pfizer and Moderna mRNA COVID-19 vaccines. They did not find a clear net benefit with regard to uh, hospitalizations. They might even have found a net deficit regarding these serious adverse events of uh, special interest. They found an excess risk, not a decreased overall risk, not a net zero risk situation, where the potential benefit of the vaccines are balanced with the potential harms. Basically, what it means is when they took the Moderna and Pfizer vaccines under their microscope, what they found was that there was a more significant risk to the health of pretty healthy individuals rather than the benefit. It's like you are thirsty and to quench your thirst, you drink a glass of poison. I mean, it will address the thirst, but for sure it will kill you. So if we, if we re, uh, rewind to the days of COVID and what our authorities have been telling us uh, on the matter, we see a clear pattern of lies. All health officials and governments around the world whom we trusted our health and our lives told us the in injection was safe. Meanwhile, adverse events reporting uh, systems around the world record previously unseen rates of adverse events and injuries. Just a few months back, a report came out after inquiring into the death of a psychologist in the UK after his Oxford AstraZeneca COVID-19 vaccine was due to unintended complications of the vaccine. We were also told that the injection were effective. What we should ask is effective for what? Not stopping transmission. You remember, right? First time they said when they were giving the jab, you just take one, you're done. And then about two months later, apparently there's a conversation about saying booster shot. We're not sure about preventing serious illness either with regard to this vaccine. Evidence by recent data and new, uh, from New South Wales health reports which shows a disproportionate number of hospitals and ICU admissions amongst the vaccinated. Meanwhile, a new shocking study by a team of Swiss doctors published in the Europe, uh, European Journal of Heart Failure revealed that Moderna's COVID booster caused 1 in 35 people to have heart injuries detectable with blood tests. The vaccinated people did not show obvious signs of heart damage, but when researchers uh, ran blood tests three days after the jab, they found high levels of troponin, a protein uh, a heart re the heart releases when it is injured in many recipients. Actually, I've done that test myself as well. It was, was really scary because if it, is, it was positive, definitely a heart attack. Over 1 billion people have received mRNA jabs around the world. The study suggests that tens of millions of them may have suffered heart damage and don't even know they've been hurt. Well, we honestly wanted to know how Sri Lankans have felt since getting the jab. Here are some of your reactions. Well, I'm not very happy about it. I'm really regretting that I took this uh, injection. And I'm also having a lot of uh, after effects. Uh, now I have already taken single uh, medicine. The negative thoughts, some that uh, psychologically there will be a, uh, the side effect 
people are viewing that uh, it will be cause some ill health but moreover the, that uh, total uh, that populations believe that this is very useful for the uh, people so without fear people now forget everything they are uh, back to the normal life actually i um, got the three doses so far i haven't come across any uh, problem so i'm quite okay uh, vaccine was really good and it uh, helped me a lot uh, because uh, when you travel also most of the countries airports uh, they were asking for the vaccine and especially my health it was really helpful for me vaccine uh, yes i have taken all doses of vaccine uh, i feel uh, uh, that now i am suffering from uh, some side effects i think it is uh, due to the results of the, the vaccine i don't feel like earlier some health problems are there some complications are there uh, shortness of breath as well and feet and uh, fed, uh, very uh, uncomfortable feeling is always there due to that uh, side uh, vaccine i think it is a side effect of the vaccine i have taken covid vaccine and all the boosters i have been suffering from side effects since i got them i don't feel uh, healthy as i did before uh, there are some issues that i have been with some positive some negative uh, we have to actually talk about this let's get more on that and for that joining me now uh, via zoom from hobart tasmania is dr julie sladen who's with the organization australians for science and freedom she is a secretary of that organization dr sladen is a medical doctor and writer with over 25 years of clinical uh, experience across multiple disciplines in australia and the uk thank you very much doctor for being here i really appreciate it now there are many concerns uh, doctor uh, report, uh, concerning reports worldwide uh, regarding the side effects of these vaccines which now seems to have been a rush job to address a pandemic in hindsight we shouldn't have acted the way we did what are you learning about these uh, vaccines especially their side effects well we're learning a lot of things as time goes on i mean obviously we had concerns right from the beginning given that there was um a very what very rushed what seemed to be a rushed um approach to putting out vaccines on a brand new platform and we know from medicine that it actually often takes a decade to um develop a new product and especially a new product that involves uh, a new technology and a new platform the mrna vaccines have been or gene therapies have been around for decades but we've never used them in this way so that really did um alert the medical and scientific community to start looking out for some of the things that we suspected might happen but certainly hoped wouldn't and we had some early reports from um the US and the UK because in Australia we received the vaccines um about 6 months sort of after all of that roll out started around the world and we were seeing um interesting reports come out of inc- increased clotting um events we were also seeing um increased reports of uh blood cancers um and we were also seeing immune problems come out and i was watching this very carefully because you know obviously as a, as a doctor I, i need to keep informed and we were of course getting information from the government and our local health sources but you know it also paid attention to look and see what was happening overseas as the vaccine program rolled out there absolutely uh, doctor the world health organization is playing these side effects uh, concerns uh, as a matter of minor matter and they say that uh, the benefit outweighs the concerns your thoughts my thoughts are i completely disagree with that assessment and i think the data actually um, bears that out I mean when you actually look at the threat of what we knew about the um the covid infection and you know we we're, we're looking back to sort of March April May 2020 there were some um epidemiologists that actually did some studies on you know how bad was the infection and what they discovered was that the um case fatality rate or the infection fatality rate was actually hovering less than 1% and the people who were vulnerable were the elderly and those who are who had multiple comorbidities now then when you look at the vac- vaccine program what then you would want to do would de- be to focus on the people who were most at risk um not the whole general population especially when you have a whole lo- lot of unknowns 
with a new vaccine platform. Um, as we've seen the vaccination program roll out around the globe, what we have seen across um, Europe and the US and Australia is we've seen a, a, a huge spike in adverse events. And, and it's not just that we've all of a sudden given a whole lot of vaccines and that then creates a number of um, increased adverse events. This, this, this number of adverse events has surpassed the adverse event rate for all other vaccines together for the last 50 years. It's a huge safety signal. Um, but not only that, even more worrying, um, something else is going on in that we're now seeing um, increased rates of excess mortality around the world, which really needs to be looked at in earnest. Um, we And we're also seeing in, uh, increased rates, and this is data that's just been presented recently by Ed Dowd from Finance Technologies, and they've been looking at insurance claims for um, people who are unable to work. Um, and that is going through the roof as well. Doctor, should people uh, who basically either been uh, forced or socially forced to take these vaccines be concerned? Is that something they can do to safeguard themselves? I think there are many things that, that can be done. Um, there is a lot of there are a lot of healthcare workers and doctors researching this around the globe because obviously there are people who have suffered both vaccine injury, which is well recognised now, and long COVID. And the things that seem to work well are fasting it seems to be very helpful for some people, um, but there are also some uh, pro products and and um, there's guidance that's actually available. The frontline critical care doctors have um, produced some good guidelines on what things can help for people who are suffering with things like fatigue or blood clots or um, neurological problems. So there, there's a lot of hope. And I think one of the most important things is to look after your, your basic health. You know, if there are things that you know that you should be doing by looking after your diet, um, doing regular exercise, making sure you get outside and get you know, fresh air and also um, spending time with loved ones, you know, because all of that contributes to good health. And I would um, really encourage people if they're concerned about their health to start, you know, doubling down and doing the things that they know that they should be doing to look after their health so that they can d then protect themselves in the long term. Absolutely. Indeed, uh, I wish I had more time uh, to continue this conversation as this is very important to everyone watching, but we have to leave it at that. That was uh, Dr. Julie Sladen from Australia's, uh, for Australians for Science and Freedom. Thank you. I need to get a second opinion on this matter. Well, joining me now from the Gold Coast in Australia via Zoom is Professor David Richards. Professor Richards is a general medical practitioner and professor at an Australian university in the Faculty of Medicine. He is also part of the Australians uh, for Science and Freedom. Thank you very much, Professor, for being here. I appreciate it. Um, professor, I know you have uh, written extensively on the efficacy and impact of the mRNA vaccines, which is basically what has been uh, given worldwide. What are your findings? Evening, Mahish. Um well, it's uh, not so much my findings, it's findings of uh, one of my colleagues in Australia, uh, Kevin McKernan, who um, recently has, well, he's, he's got 25 years uh, experience in in genomics, in, in genomic sequencing. And he was sequencing some samples that were sent to him of RNA vaccines. And um, during the deep sequencing, much to his surprise, he found substantial amounts of DNA uh, in in the samples. Now, the according to the uh, TGA and according to the FDA, these are RNA vaccines. These, these are pure RNA vaccines. And the amount of DNA that uh, Dr. McKernan found was, was far in excess of what is considered to be uh, acceptable. Uh, the, the amount was about 30%, I believe. Um, and since then, uh, similar things have been found, uh, the findings have been validated in a number of uh, research facilities around the world. So it seems to be fairly solid. And uh, the implications of this are quite significant because um, much, much was made in the, early, in the early 
weeks and months of the vaccine rollout of, uh, about the fact that the RNA is degraded very quickly. Uh, typically, RNA degrades within 24, 48 hours. And so the belief was and the um, the narrative was that the RNA and subsequently the spike protein would disappear from the circulation uh, very, very quickly within within perhaps two or three days, a week at the most. The, signific the significance of the are, are of the presence of the DNA is that the, the half-life of DNA is not 48 hours. The half-life of DNA is 590 years. It's 580. So this puts a totally different complexion on the on the breakdown and the elimination of elements of the vaccination from the body. Now, what the implications of that are uh, and certain. I mean, it's it's unquantifi it's unquantifiable. And so, but this poses vastly different questions to the the, the beliefs and the uh, and the understanding that was pervasive at the uh, at the rollout at the origins of the first rollout of the vaccinations. Alarming indeed, uh, Professor. Reports are coming from various parts of the world, uh, especially concerning heart health in young people. What have you found on that front? Um, is there a link between certain mRNA vaccines and heart issues? Well, there's a number of papers currently being circulated looking at the incidence of, uh, of uh, myocarditis and pericarditis in people receiving the RNA vaccines. Um, fa famously, there was a, a paper published in Thailand uh, last year identifying that about one in 800 recipients of the vaccination experience myocardial events, um, typically in the form of myocarditis or, or pericarditis. Uh, and that was taken to be a, a rule, a, a measure of the incidence of these events in people who were receiving the vaccinations. Um, however, more recently, a number of papers have been published. Uh, one Sure, already accepted for publication in the European European Journal of Heart Failure, which suggests that um, the, the incidence may be far greater than was originally uh, originally reported, even compared to the Thai paper. Now, how do you explain the differences in 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 detection? Well, the the differences are dependent upon how uh, how rigorously you identify the, the 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 sequence of events occurring in the heart after vaccination um you know uh, for example a lot of national reporting systems they rely on people reporting their symptoms uh subsequent to subsequent to vaccination um in the Thai study they used various modalities to identify um identify injuries that might have occurred in the heart. But in this recent study, it, there's a much more active and um, comprehensive inquiry into what's happening in events subsequent to vaccination, uh, monitoring not only uh, uh, blood tests, uh, but also scanning the heart and, uh, and, and, uh, and, and ha using a panel to a panel of experts to determine whether heart injury has occurred. Now, in this study about to be published in the European Journal of Heart Failure, they found that the incidence of myocardial damage was 2.5% of people receiving vaccination, so which is substantial. Professor, uh, what I'm curious to know, if you remember back in 2020 and 2021 at the height of the pandemic, uh, we were told by governments along with organizations uh, like the, the WHO that, those, uh, that these vaccines are the safest. And in fact, we got them so quick, unlike the other season vaccine, which, they, uh, which take years to make. They made it sound as if the vaccine was so perfectly safe, if not the vaccines, then how should we uh, proceed amid a full-blown pandemic? Well, I, I think there was already a, a pandemic plan in place in most countries. Uh, been, certainly in Australia, uh, in Sweden, um, you know, Tony Abbott had, had spent much, Tony Abbott, who was formerly 
Prime Minister of Australia, spent much time and detail when he was Health Secretary um, creating a pandemic plan in Australia. And um, Sweden um, famously stuck to their pandemic plan right through the uh, right through the whole pandemic period. And now we see that Sweden um, adopting a more traditional approach to uh, managing the pandemic are recording incredibly good outcomes uh, as a result of their approach. Um, and so right early on, um, you know, uh, number of uh, leading epidemi epidemiologists, uh, Jay Bhattacharya from Stanford University, Martin Kuldorf from uh, Harvard, and Sanupta Gupta from Oxford University, got together and uh, and created or, or, or pr produced the Great Barrington Declaration. And in the Great Barrington Declaration, declaration they articulated very clearly that um, the, 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 the correct approach was to protect the vulnerable, uh, what they term targeted protection, but allow the majority of healthy people, young people, to continue to get on with their lives because basically um, they, they, it was very clear from the data that they'd studied that COVID-19 was not a serious threat to people under the age of 40, that the the incident, the mortality rates from COVID-19 in people in younger age groups was less than the mortality rate seen with seasonal influenza. So, um, so basically it was very clear right at the beginning, uh, the path that should have been taken and, and, and would have been appropriate, but governments around the world decided for reasons under, beknownst um, that they would adopt a new plan, which seemed to be uh, orchestrated by Deborah Burks at the, from the White House and um, and um, and C CDC, um, and and countries fell into line. The UK, Australia, um, it was a, it was like a a dog whistle to the world. They 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 sang a tune and everybody danced along. Indeed. Uh... Very quickly, Professor, what should people who've taken the vaccine, basically each and everyone here in Sri Lanka should do in order to ensure that uh, we are not victims? What must we keep uh, a lookout for with regard to our health? Um, wow, well, that's a very, very difficult question to answer because, because uh, the we, we, this is a novel treatment. It's a novel, um, uh, a, a novel um therapy uh, nobody has ever used um this kind of technology in large scale settings and so consequently there's no experience but i think um i think the most important thing is what, what have i seen in my clinical practice well i think the thing that people have uh, um brought to my attention more than anything else is respiratory issues you know breathing problems um particularly shortness of breath with exercise. And um, so, you know, if, if I'm suspicious that someone is developing a, um, you know, some kind of, con you know, some kind of compromise, you know, no matter how it might have occurred, whether it occurred as a result of the vaccination or whether it occurred as a result of COVID or whatever, um, there are some simple blood tests that can be done that, that can, you know, quickly at least eliminate any serious um, consequences. So I would suggest that they visit their, their doctors, tell them that, look, they're, they're, they're feeling these symptoms, particularly fatigue, breathlessness, um, you know, not being able to maintain the exercise uh, performance that they would normally be able to achieve and uh, ask, ask them, ask their doctor to, uh, to, you know, evaluate the, uh, their, their clinical status to see, that they they they're maintaining good and proper health. You know, uh, as um, as was said by as Benjamin Franklin said, an ounce of protection is worth a pound of cure. Indeed, uh, we really have to keep this conversation going on, uh, Professor, because this is very important, and people will start coming out uh, talking about this matter as 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 things progress. Let's leave it at that, Professor David Richards from the Australian University. Thank you very much. So after all that we've learned, 
We wanted to know what our government, the Sri Lankan government, is doing about these issues. Have they taken prompt action to inform everyone if we are feeling this way or that way to get ourselves immediately checked up? Have they provided information on this? Or, as usual, are they blind to all this and moving on um, up until uh, an outcry from the public sets in? Or, better yet, uh, a Western think tank tells them what to do? So our producers were trying frantically to get a response from the Minister of Health. He spoke to us briefly and then later di directed us to the chief epidemiologist, Dr. Samitha Ginike, who said he was not worried. All is cool. The vaccine have no issues. And it's not a big deal right now. So there you go, folks. Our trusted government and the health ministry are on top of it. Let's take a short break and more State of the Nation right after this. Now, last month, we all saw what happened at the only telecom giant that we as Sri Lankans own, the Sri Lanka Telecom. We saw its chairman, Rohan Fernando, being removed from office in a rush job. This came after the IMF pushed the need to privatize the telecom giant, making all communication, uh, telecommunication service providers in Sri Lanka owned by foreign companies. Now, when we dug a bit deep, we found something very concerning. In a letter written to the Securities and Exchange Commission, a shareholder of Sri Lanka Telecom states that the current non-executive chairman of Sri Lanka Telecom, Mohamed Reyes, has violated the Company Act No. 7 of 2007. The reason they stipulate is that the current chairman of SLT is sitting on boards of other organizations that are in direct conflict with SLT. The organization in question is called Just-in-Time Group, an information and technology company in Sri Lanka. On 23rd of February 2023, Just In Time Holdings Private Limited institute a court action against Sri Lanka Telecom PLC in case number CA-RIT-118-2023 filed at the Court of Appeal in which mandates the nature of writ of certiorari and prohibition are sought against a decision made by the chairman of Sri Lanka Telecom PLC in his ex officio capacity. This means uh, that the person sitting as the chairman of Sri Lanka Telecom is also on the board of Just-in-Time Holdings by being a non-executive director of its parent company, Agility Innovations. When you sit on both boards, on the board of the company that is suing you and also the company that's getting sued, anyone would say that it looks very unethical and wrong. However, we also found out that the current chairman emailed the secretary of the board confirming his uh, board positions in these conflicting companies on the 21st of July 2023. However, this should have been made known to the board on the day he was appointed as a non-executive board member of SLT on 30th of March 2023. This is why it looks like he has violated the Company Act of 7 of 2007. Now, why am I bringing this issue to you? That is to alert you as to how these types of boardroom coups occur in the private sector and on paper it looks pretty damning and can lead towards corrupt practices. And that itself is my argument. There are a lot of issues like this occurring within the private sector. However, the private sector itself has been cunning enough to point the finger at the public sector corruption thus far deflecting the rotten within. Well, joining me now is parliamentarian and former Minister of Energy, Uday Gamman Pillar. Good to see you, sir, once again. Thank you very much for being here. Now, as explained, even though there is a lot of effort to curb issues uh, about corruption in the state sector, uh, parliamentarian, we see some institutions uh, just like the SLT 
having the chairmen of the board appointed where he himself is sitting on other boards of companies where they are suing each other. Ethically and morally, I'm afraid that's not right. Should the government step in? Well, my age, any company director is duty bound to disclose his conflict of interest and interest in contracts of the company. It is more applicable to quoted companies because quoted companies such as SLT because unlike unquoted companies, quoted companies have raised their capital from the general public. Directors are the trustees who manage uh, uh, funds of the shareholders on behalf of the shareholders. Therefore, directors that is why I said directors are duty bound to disclose their, uh, their interest truthfully. When the company is owned by the state, ownership is distributed among entire 22 million Sri Lankans. So, entire nation owns that company. So, the, tr the burden of truthful disclosure is very high for the state companies like the SLT. Unfortunately, present chairman of the SLT, Mr. Riaz uh, Mihuler, has failed in this sacred duty. Just in, uh, just in time, Enable and KBSL are three subsidiaries of Agility Innovation, of which Mr. Mihuler is a director. These subsidiaries directly deal with telecom and reportedly, Telecom has filed action against uh, just in time for malpractices, corrupt practices. Therefore, he should have disclosed his uh, relationship with these companies. He can't say I was not aware of because he is the he is the chairman of the audit uh, audit subcommittee of that company. Then uh, he must be aware of uh, the business transaction of these subsidiaries. If he was not aware, then he should have looked into. So, uh, because of this backdrop, I think, uh, in this backdrop, I think, Chairman of Sri Lanka, uh, Sri Lanka Telecom, Mr. Riaz Mueller, must tender his resignation immediately with a public apology. Indeed, uh, Parliamentary in one of the areas that needs uh, to be taken into consideration when addressing corporate sector corruption. Well, corporate sector uh, corruption has been in existence as long as corporate sector has been in existence. Unfortunately, since there is no the so-called opposition for the corporate sector, those are not surfaced uh, sufficiently and uh, we are glad this kind of uh, things uh, becomes topic of the uh, media as well as the society in general. Government has a duty in respect of uh, ensuring the uh, government has a duty to prevent malpractices in the corporate sector. Firstly, now take a company like SLT. It is not only a state owned company, it is a public quoted company. Then uh, Security and Exchange Commission, SCC is the watchdog. So, SCC can't turn blind eye, eye to this kind of malpractices. So, SCC has a uh, duty to supervise. When it comes to the banks and finance, the central bank is a regulator. In addition to that, now we have certain accounting standards. Company acts has prescribed certain disclosures in account accounts. But who is here to? probe into and ensure the public that these companies have adhered to the legal requirement of disclosures and publications. Unfortunately, there is nobody. Therefore, I think we, the media shall create a public discussion to pressurize the government to bring laws to have a best corporate practices. The companies claim we are very responsible corporate citizen, we do good uh, corporate practices, but uh, th there is a huge gap between what they preach and what they practice. Therefore, I think a regulatory mechanism should be brought in to ensure uh, that uh, good governance is practiced by our corporate sector as well. Absolutely. All right. We have to leave it at that. Uh, that was parliamentarian Uday Gamman Pillar, leader of the Pivituru Hela Urumia. Thank you.
Let's get uh, some perspective with regard to the law uh, about corporate corruption. Joining me now is President's Counsel Mohan Virakon. Thank you very much, sir, for your time. So now, in many instances, uh, the state sector corruption is highlighted and laws and regulations are being brought in for just that. But are our laws stronger on the corporate corruption? Yes, Mahesh, thank you very much for inviting me. Uh, as you all know, corruption in the public sector is rampant and corruption in the private sector is also there. But there is no law to govern private sector corruption up to now. Our Bribery Act, Act has a section, section 70, which says any public servant who with intent to commit. It's all about public servants. So no corporate private entity will be found fault for corruption. Understood. Uh, sir, one of the arguments brought forward uh, is that uh, since the private sector brings in the funding, it's no one else's business. But in most instances, we see that businesses are impacting the public. For an example, in the year 2000, a private bank collapsed due to misappropriation of funds uh, and people who invested in that bank are still suffering. So does that argument have any validity? That argument has no validity, Mahesh, because the private sector organizations are all on the share market. So their owners are diversified and there are so many owners. There can be few large shareholders, but basically it's the people's companies. So they have a responsibility to uh, eradicate corruption and bribery. So what I see is the corporate, the corporates in the country, which are wholly privately owned, are basically less corrupted than the entities which are partly owned by the government. Because what I see is that the, when there is a change of government, uh, directors are appointed to certain uh, corporates which the government has shares. So ultimately, it all depends on the, uh, the credibility and the, uh, whether the directors are good or bad. So basically, a bad director is appointed to a public entity or a private organization with the government has shares can ruin the organization. So that has happened in our country because very few uh, organizations which are the com companies which the government has shares are doing well. Indeed, it makes a lot of sense. All right, we have to leave it at that. That was President's Council Mohan Veerakorn. Appreciate it, sir. Short break now. More State of the Nation once we return. Back in a moment. Welcome back everyone to the State of the Nation. Now let's talk about the state of our economy. Last month, a Bloomberg article headline, Sri Lanka's rupee goes from Asia's best to worst in three weeks. Pretty arrogant, isn't it? If you ask, this, uh, ask the central bank governor. Of course, that's exactly what the central bank did. Uh, they were very swift to explain why the dip in the rupee and how it'll bounce back. However, Bloomberg isn't letting it go without a fight. They say, quoting a financial analyst agency, Natixis, that the rupee will end the year at 355 to the dollar. To put that into perspective, uh, well, that was the range the rupee existed back in July of 2022 that led to the insurrection resulting in the ousting of former President Gotabe Rajpaksa. However, that ha happening in 2023, there's no issue. Why? Well, we are worshipping the IMF called exactly how they say. So how can things go wrong? The current administration on our finances is telling us that apparently we are on the right track. But are you feeling it? Does it feel like we as a nation are on the right track? How are your monthly bills? Does your monthly salary stretch enough to cover the expenditure? Are you praying on a daily basis to all the gods not to bring 
and unexpected expenses uh, your way? How about many trips you used to take in order to relax in those days? Oh, you're not taking it anymore because everything else is costly? Well, you really look at it, it seems that what our authorities are saying doesn't match what's really happening on the ground. I mean, if you ask those Colombo hoity toity liberal idiot class, of course, it ain't hard for them because all the deals under the IMF have uh, secured the top 1%, but you and me taking the heat from all sides isn't, that's what's happening. While they are slipping their cocktails and going to bougie high teas. So are the policies implemented by the government, like the domestic debt restructuring, really helping the SME sector in Sri Lanka? Mind you, we know for a fact that domestic debt restructuring helps the banks and ergo the top 1%. But what about the rest of the 99% in this nation who is basically the backbone of our economy? Joining me now is the chairman of Blue Ocean Group, Mr. Thumilan Sivaraja. Blue Ocean Group uh, is a Sri Lankan-owned real estate company growing um, currently. Thank you very much, sir, for your time. How have the economic policies, uh, course corrections, and more importantly, the domestic debt restructuring implemented by this government, as per the recommendations of the IMF, uh, has impacted your business? Are things on the right track for you? Yes, Mahesh, uh, this is uh, as you exactly asked, the local debt restructuring, which has to be done uh, on the international borrowing, they have to a certain extent, they have initiated. But as well as the SME sector point of view, unfortunately, still the banks are not reducing the interest rate. As you correctly said, the debt restructuring, it is a matter of postponing our debts and to a certain extent, haircut our creditors, which may have a subsequent effect on the future borrowing or international recognition. Uh, as well as uh, the next issue is whether the debt structuring, postponing the debt, how you are going to create a revenue sources, that is GDP. So it is more important to create a GDP to pay off all these debts. So therefore, the government has to push the banks immediately to reduce the interest rate to at least close to the one digit, which is not happen at the moment, which have a severe impact on the SME sectors, including real estate and construction. Yep, indeed, uh, it makes a lot of sense. Uh, I'm sure you, by now you have calculated uh, how your business will proceed uh, in the next few months. What are you, what are you anticipating? It is uh, just, uh, Manshi, this good news is there is a prospective tourism is coming to the country. Like that, uh, in our company, the Blue Ocean Residence, uh, Blue Ocean Group, we are getting a lot of sales and the inquiries from the overseas buyers uh, because they want to come for the retirement home and all that. So we are very confident before December, which will be turnarounding in a significant way to boost the economy. But the government, as you correctly said, the government economic uh, fiscal policies also should support and it has to maintain in a consistency manner. The, one of the main issue at present is the policies are changing at hoc basis. Uh, suddenly, you know, the artificial taxes has been introduced, suddenly the import ban brought up. So therefore, the cost of material of the building material has escalated in an artificial way which is not predicted or unforeseen by anybody. Therefore, we would like the government to maintain a consistency policies. With, with uh, those consistency policies, we are very confident we can turn around this industry. All right, we have to leave it at that. Uh, good to talk to you. That was the chairman of Blue Ocean Group, Mr. Sivaraja Thumilan. Appreciate it. A break now, back with the closing. Today there's a discussion about Sri Lanka's national anthem. 
This was after singer Umara sang an opera rendition of the national anthem which sparked outrage from most Sri Lankans. While the Colombo liberal idiot class, well, as usual in matters of national pride, can't give two hoots. I don't know whether she gave an ode to the whole uh, trans conversation occurring in the West by changing the words from Mother Lanka to Mr. Lanka. Tonight, honestly, I'm not interested in that conversation, but I'm more interested in posing this question to every Sri Lankan. Why are we talking about our national anthem when most of us from both sides of the aisle has forgotten the true meaning of that anthem? Shouldn't this incident instead be calling us to really remember the true meaning of it and practice it in a manner that will fulfill the aspirations of this nation? Ananda Samrakon didn't write some words and compose a tune to make sure that you sing like there is no tomorrow. He made an anthem which has a meaning that would fuel your Sri Lankan nationalism and nationalistic pride and a calling for everyone to work hard for Mother Lanka. We forget the true meaning of our anthem and that's why most of them forget what to say. Now, there is this beautiful verse which we always sing but never practice which goes as Ekka mavaka gedaru kalabavina yamu yamu veenu pama prema vada sama beda durarada namo namo mata Perhaps it's time to start practicing the national anthem. On a programming note, State of the Nation will take a break in the next few weeks of August and will return back in September with a refreshed look to talk about issues that matter to you. And also, do get in touch with us as we would like to hear your views, feedbacks and suggestions. You can write to us about anything you saw on the program. You agree, disagree. Please send us your comments to stateofthenation at derana.lk. I'm Mahish Johnny. From all of us at Adda Derana 24, have a good night and a productive week. I'll see you on Tuesday on Get Ready. See you then. Bye for now.